What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the last installment of reviewing my friend Matt's Vintage Cube. Today we're going to go over the final two sections, which is multicolor and lands. So we'll start with Azorius, Soul Herder, Spell Queller, Teferi, Fractured, and Teferi. Pretty, pretty standard lineup. Uh, let's open my cube. That's the maybe board. We're gonna go around right around here. I have Invasion of New Phyrexia because I think it's cool. It's a new card. It turns into a Planeswalker. It makes a bunch of two twos. Very similar to Fourth Eorlingus in terms of mana value, uh, except it's making two twos with Vigilance instead of Haste. Uh, and you can hit this and flip it into Teferi. So that's cool. I have Soul Herder and Teferi as well. I also have Shorakai Genesis Engine. This was a card from the Neon Genesis Commander set that I really liked. It's basically a four mana artifact for, for the most part, but you can pay one and tap it to draw two and discard one and make a one, one pilot. So eventually you're able to crew this with like three pilots, make an eight, eight. And until then you're basically mega looting with this card. Draw two, discard one, and make a 1-1 one, one every time. It's pretty cool. I also have Fractured and Teferi. So, I have six. What am I missing? Spell Queller? Yeah, Spell Queller is kind of meh. I mean, it doesn't feel like there's a ton of blue-white tempo decks. I feel like usually white and blue aren't paired in that kind of deck. But, I don't know. Card's fine. I just don't think it's super exciting. Belfast Strix, Ashiok, Thief, Fallen, and Scarab God. I literally have all, all five of these. My cube has <clears throat> Urtai Resurrected. I think Urtai is absolutely fantastic. It's one of the most versatile new cards uh, I've seen added to the cube. It's It pretty much does everything. <laughs> I used to think the drawback of letting them always draw a card was bad, but I really think the versatility of, of Urtai outweighs that by a significant margin. Being able to counter an, a spell, an activated ability, a triggered ability, or kill a creature or a planeswalker that's already in play is just so good. And I have a blue black planeswalker. Whenever one or more creatures you control deals combat damage to a player, you may return one of them to its owner's hand. If you do, you can activate loyal abilities of Kaito twice this turn rather than once. So if you have a Baleful Strix and you attack, you can return it to your hand and then activate Kaito twice. So the plus one is up to one target creature can't attack or block until your next turn. Or you draw two cards with zero, assuming you do it twice. Or negative two, you make a 2-2 two -two drone with death touch. And when this creature leaves the battlefield, each opponent loses two and you gain two. So it kind of works with Kaito's ability, although you'll never, <laughs> you'll never be able to replay it. But it is making a 2-2 two -two death toucher. So, I mean, it's just, I think Kaito's kind of a, a cool planeswalker. So I'm trying him out. If he doesn't... Um, if he doesn't work, we'll either take him out and replace it with something or just put in a different card. Then Matt has Blood Tithe Harvester, which I think is good. Uh, Croxa, Doretti, Fire Covenant, Kolagon's Command, and Chaos Defiler. I like all of these. I think Fire Covenant's good. Uh, it's a good addition. I also do like Blood Tithe Harvester. I don't think I have it in mine. He has six Rakdos cards. I also have six. I have Valky, God of Lies, because I also have Bring to Light, which I think is... A pretty sweet combo, and also just casting Valky for like seven is pretty easy in the cube, especially when the majority of his mana is uh, colorless. So it works with like Mana Vault, Thran Dynamo, Worn Power Stone, stuff like that. Uh, Doretti, Kolagon's Command, Obnixilus the Adversary. He has Doretti too, right? Yeah. Uh, and Chaos Defiler as well. Chaos Defiler is a 40k card. I think this card's really sweet. It's a 5-4 for 5 with Trample, and when it enters the battlefield or dies, for each opponent, you choose a non-land permanent and destroy it. So you're destroying two non-land permanents. It's kind of like a 5-mana Archon of... Cruel... Not Archon of Cruelty. Archon of... Why am I drawing a blank here? Ashen Rider. <laughs> because it's not an Archon of anything. That's why, stupid. Obnixilus the Adversary is a three mana planeswalker with three loyalty with casualty X. So if anyone who doesn't know, casualty means you can sacrifice a uh, creature um, and put a copy of Obnixilus into play. 
Uh, as you cast this, you may sacrifice a creature with power X where uh, the starting loyalty is X. That's what I was looking for. So if you if you sacrifice a four drop, he has four. If you sacrifice a seven drop, you can literally just ultimate him the turn he comes in to play the copy. Target player draws seven and loses seven. Um, but yeah, each opponent loses two unless they discard a card. If you control a demon or devil, you gain two. And the negative two is create a one, one red devil with when this dies deals one damage to anything. It's again, it's a three mana planeswalker that can be that you can get two copies of and two, two copies of this plus one is pretty sweet. So that's why I included that guy. Gruul, we have Manamorphose, Ren, Minsk, and Escape. I have all three of these. I do not have Manamorphose because I think it's, again, another useless Storm card. And, like, you're just never seeing anyone play Manamorphose outside of Storm. <laughs> and if you are, it's like they're either low on playables or they're trying to greedily splash something. Which is fine, but, like, I would, again, I'd rather just have a card that's cooler, that people are more excited about playing. So... Gruel 4, I have Gruel 7. I have Miglaw's Maze Crusher, which is a 3-mana 4-4. Four, four. He has 5 oil counters. 1, you can remove to give him Vigilance and Menace. 2, you can remove uh, to give him plus 2, plus 2. And 3, you can remove to destroy an artifact or an enchantment. So just another really effective way of getting rid of an artifact or an enchantment on a pretty reasonable body. I also still have Huntmaster, because Huntmaster is good. Matt doesn't have Dragon Lord of Tarka either. So he has Ren, Minsk, and Escape. So my differences are Miglaws, Huntmaster, Gigantha, and Dreadlord, Dragon Lord of Tarka. I have Gigantha in here because, uh, I again, I have a five-color uh, archetype in my cube. So Gigantha is just a cool way to just play this guy, and then the next turn you can cast any of your five five-color spells. So we got El Eladomri's Call. Voice of Resurgence, Knight of Autumn, Knight of the Reliquary, Tristani, and Torsten. I know Torsten was a new addition for him. We both talked about this, and I think we both liked it. Um, I replaced Avenger of Zendikar with Torsten, because I just think Torsten's a little bit cooler. Um, it, it, the, one of the reasons is Avenger of Zendikar kind of sucks, because like you don't want it too early, because then you don't get enough plant tokens. But you still want it early. Like you want a big seven, you want a big seven mana creature early. Like I want to get it out as soon as possible. But if you get it out on turn two, you only get like two plant tokens. So, you know, if you're going like natural order, I'd rather natural order into Torsten than natural order into Avenger. Eladomri's call is kind of fine. Like I just find that there's not a ton of times where I want creatures in my hand. And if I do, you have, I mean, he already has both Fauna Shaman and uh, Survival of the Fittest, both of which do this better and they're easier to cast. Like, I'd rather have that kind of like repeatability. Like, I just don't think there's many decks that are like, I want to spend two mana to search my library for a creature. Usually you want a Tooth and Nail or Natural Order or, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I guess this is like, this is fine with like something like channel where you do want the creature in your hand, but at the same time, like you don't want to have a green, you don't want to pay two mana and then channel the next turn. It's just kind of like not super efficient. <clears throat> I also, I'm not a huge voice of resurgence fan. I also, I just don't think green white is an archetype that's drafted that heavily. And I think the archetype that green white is, is usually more land based, which is why you do want like Knight of the reliquary. And then Matt and I had a conversation about Trostani Discordant where um, one of his draft, like his draft boys, the guys he drafts with, uh, a friend of ours, said this is like a necessity in the queue. And I just totally disagree. Like, I mean, it counters like three abilities, right? Like you have Sower, Bribery, Treachery, like those kind of effects. But like, honestly, Sower is a 2-2. Treachery is an, uh, an enchantment or a... a, a any any enchantment removal will get rid of a treachery. Like, this is a five-mana creature. And, like, it's just not exciting on its own. Like, I'm never like, oh, yes, I have to put Trostani in my deck. Sure, maybe you'll sideboard it against certain decks. But, like, I don't know. It's just not super exciting. So my Celestnias, Jensen Carthalion. Again, this was for my uh, five-color archetype. It's a 2-2 two, two for two. Whenever you cast a multicolor spell, you get to scry. And if the spell is all, all colors, you create a 4-4 angel. So just a nice benefit for casting like five color spells. And then also just you can filter five mana for five of all colors. So pretty reasonable. Like even if you're playing like 
um, Niv Mizzet Reborn. Like this is still a pretty good option. Like because you know you're casting a ton of multicolor spells, you're scrying a ton. He, he counts as like a Celestia hit. Knight of Autumn and Knight of Reliquary, Yasharn, which I just think is a solid body. It's a four four for four. When it enters the battlefield, so you get you get both a forest and a plains. So you get you draw two. And players can't pay life or sacrifice non-land permanents to cast spells or activate abilities. So it shuts off things like dismember. It shuts off. It shuts off other things. I'm tr- um, like the Phyrexian mana costs in Nissa, things like that. Um, I'm wondering if this works with channel. I'm not actually sure because it's a mana ability, but I'm actually not sure if it even works with Frexian mana now that I think about it. If not, I'll have to reconsider, but I, I don't, otherwise it's just a four, 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 four that draws you two. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, then we have Orzov, Tide Hollow Sculler, Kaya Orzov Usurper. I think this was one that was in my queue for a long time too. And then I just didn't, I think it's just when it comes into play, it doesn't do anything. And then sometimes you can get a mox or something with it, but like, it's not, there's so many times where it's just not exciting. You're not going to main deck it. Usually you're going to sideboard it. If they're either playing graveyard strategies or if they have a bunch of one mana, uh, non-land permanents and the negative six is not super negative five is not super impressive. And then I just have Loris vindicate and Ashen rider as well. I, I, I could go either way on tide hollow sculler. It's a card that comes around 14th pick. Like no one really, Again, this is kind of funny because it speaks to uh, like Kite Sail, Freebooter, Brain Maggot, Mesmeric Fiend. Um, like, again, like how, how many of these do you really need? Like there's there's four two mana creatures that steal uh, cards. So my Orzhov is a little, little thicker. I got a dam. And I put this in the Orzhov slot because you can cast as an exclusively black card or you can literally cast it as just a white wrath of god like it can go in a mono white deck which is kind of cool so it's literally both colors but it doesn't require both colors and then we have Luris, and we have vindicate i have soren vengeful bloodlord because i think if you are playing like a black white uh tempo deck like this gets back so many of the good creatures at three and at two <laughs> so kind of versatile there um, Kaya the Inexorable and Kaya the Intangible. I have two different Kayas in here. One is put a ghost form counter up to one non-token creature. That creature gains when it dies, uh, or is put into exile, return it to its owner's hand and create a one, one spirit token with flying. So you just, you target your own creatures with this basically. And if they die, you just get them back and you get one ones. And then negative three is just exile and on land permanent, which is just fine. Negative seven gives you an emblem at the beginning of your upkeep. You may cast a legendary spell from your hand, from your graveyard, or from among cards you own in exile without paying its mana cost. So for like a cube, that would also consider your sideboard. Uh, and then Kaya six drop, seven drop has haste, or hexproof rather, plus two. Each opponent loses three and you gain three, so six point life swing. Zero draws you two cards, then each opponent may scry one. And then negative three is exile a creature or an enchantment. If it wasn't an aura... You create a token that's a copy of it, except it's a one one white spirit. So you can literally like exile their Muldrifter for three and then like get a copy of a Muldrifter and draw two. Like being able to exile creatures in cube and then make copies of them is pretty sweet. And the Nashon Rider. So slightly different. See, I, I you, can, you can tell like I, I skew towards these like fun splashy cards with unique effects like obviously making a ghost putting a ghost form counter on a creature and then it makes a one one when it dies or like exiling a creature and you get a you get a one one from it or you know draw two lands when it comes into play or tap for five mana like i i I kind of um lean towards these cards that have unique effects and they have like big splashy abilities that you really have to think about how to um integrate them into your game like how to best utilize them so is it we have expressive iteration which is fantastic just a really good card and i just i just haven't put it in i think there's too many similar cards like ponder preordain hard evidence cataxium like these are all one mana cards that kind of do similar things brainstorm ancestral recall (coughs) you know they're all basically one and two mana instants and sorceries that get you get you card advantage like again I, i would probably just put it in though if i could find room and i didn't 
I wasn't like looking forward to putting other cards in instead. Third Path Iconoclast is fantastic. This this flat out replaced uh, Young Pyromancer for me, which looks like looks like it's not in here either. Like being able to trigger off of any non-creature spell and not just instants and sorceries is pretty big. Um, Dak Faden, Lutri is interesting. I'm not a big Lutri fan, and the main reason is I get that it's a free spell in cube because all your spells are going to be in, be singletons. Um, I guess it's just that it costs three. So, like, all the instants and sorceries I don't want to copy are, like, f three to four mana. So, I guess it's... Maybe it's good. Actually, it's probably pretty good. I like it a lot. I'm going to put one in my sideboard, and we'll see if we'll see if I like it. Prismari Command is good. I think it's a little too similar to Kolagon's Command. And I love Magma Opus. Never going to... Never going to not love Magma Opus. I... Apparently, I do have Expressive Iteration. I didn't even know. Yeah. So, apparently, I, I think it's great. Um, like I said, I just didn't, I didn't think I included it, but I'm glad I did. It's, it's a really solid card. And then we have third path iconoclast, Dak Faden as well. This Sahili is one I added after playing the most recent vintage cube a lot, because it's just, it was just really, really good. Making a bunch of tokens ends up helping so many different cards like Gaia's Cradle, uh, Teleran Academy, um, What's the other one? There was another card that like really cares about the number of artifacts and or creatures that you have, but yeah, Urza. Um, so like there's a bunch of different cards that really, really benefit from the one, one servos that you make and you just play this and kind of ignore it. Also, there were definitely times where I targeted, I copied different artifacts I had, like I would play a blight steel or, you know, any big idiot, right? Uh, Atali, right, for example, and then I would copy it with a creature that didn't have summoning sickness and attack with that creature. So I'd be like, okay, make my 1-1 one, one a Blightsteel. Attack you with the Blightsteel that's already in play. So, I mean, like, it was definitely relevant, and I think this card is really strong. Joyra is kind of a pet card that I have in my cube whenever you cast a Historic Spell draw card, because Historic Spells includes artifacts, and if you're, like, Zornor, Mox, tap both for an Everflowing Chalice, like, can you draw three? I just think Joyra is a really, really sweet card. Um, and I think in the right decks, like she can really pop off. Like this is a great, I think this card fits perfectly in the artifact decks, like with Doretti, with Urza, things like that. Karanos is a card I've had in my cube for the longest time and just probably not going to take him out. I think it's just a really sweet card. Maybe I'll take him out. It's really sweet though. Like you're just drawing a card or lightning bolting every turn and eventually he's just a six, five and then Magma Opus, obviously. So we're now on Golgari, Assassin's Trophy. I like Grist, Life, Death. I've, I also added this because I think the two mana side is kind of on the sweet spot. Like, it's nice to have one more sub three mana reanimate spell. And it's just basically a toned down reanimate. Maelstrom Pulse. I, I might have taken Maelstrom Pulse out. I'm not sure. And Vraska is great. Um... Mosswood Dread Knight is a new addition I added. Um, obviously drawing the card, then making the Dread Knight. And then if he dies, you get to draw the card again. So we'll see if he's any good. Um, I'm not sure. I think forcing you into black, green, and then also forcing when you have to activate the abilities is kind of clunky. But I'm not sure. And then I think Glissa Sunslayer is fantastic. 3-3 three, three for 3, first strike, a death touch. Whenever it deals combat damage, you choose one. Either you draw a card great destroy an enchantment great or remove up to three counters from a permanent so you can uh it's very similar to questing beast in that you can attack their face and then remove three counters from one of their planeswalkers to kill it so it's kind of like a mini questing beast and she has first strike and death touch so uh also have grist also have life death i have karth the lion because i think he's pretty sweet with like a planeswalker strategy so if you're playing like sultai or teamer and you just get a bunch of cool planeswalkers like this guy um, kind of benefits that. <laughs> and then you can like, look at the top seven cards when he dies and you can reel Planeswalker, put it in your hand. So Marin of Clan Neltoth was another really, really strong card that I really loved having in the cube. Just being able to get either a creature back every turn or a creature put onto the battlefield every turn was very strong. Yep, and there's Vraska. And I do not have Maelstrom Pulse. I took Maelstrom Pulse out a while ago. I think it's just, it's not super needed. I mean, it's just kind of slow. 
and it just doesn't do any like like you know now you have grist um you have Vraska to do a similar thing like there's a bunch of cards that do very similar things to maelstrom pulse figure of destiny fourth eorlingus rip apart is pretty sweet i really like that he put this in here I think dealing three damage to a creature or planeswalker or destroying an artifact or enchantment is very versatile. And I think this is like much better than like a wear tear, for example. Uh, Zerda. I don't know if I added Zerda. I might have. Yep, I did. I thought the, I thought the interactions with like infinite combos with Grim Monolith or like Basalt Monolith or whatever were just really, really good. And I think like two card combos that let you go infinite, but the cards individually are not super strong, specifically Zerda are kind of good. Um, I think, I think Matt might've added comment on my suggestion, but I'm not sure. But yeah, I have comment in mine and I also have showdown at the scalds of the scalds as well. So I have figure, I have fourth, I have general Ferris Rokerik because I do have a multicolor theme in my queue with Niv Mizzet Reborn. Um, so yeah, this guy's pretty sweet. Um, just cast any multicolor spell, make a four, four. I, that's pretty powerful. Also have Zerda. I still have Nahiri because I think it's another good way to get Eldrazi into play in addition to like sneak attack, addition to through the breach. Like I think just plussing her twice is pretty sweet. Plus it's a loot effect. Plus you can exile enchantments, artifacts, or creatures. Like I think this is a versatile planeswalker and I still think she's good. And here I have three, three hits. Othari was in the most recent vintage cube. So it's not really a, a a dark horse here, but I have Jiru and Hazaret for five mana. You get a five, four. As long as you have one or fewer cards in hand, this has vigilance and haste. Okay. That's cool. Whenever it attacks, look at the top six cards of your library. You may exile a legendary creature from among them. Put the rest in the bottom of your library in a random order until the end of the turn. You may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So if you look at the top six, you hit an Emrakul, you hit a Kozilek, you just get to cast it. I don't know. This card seems really sweet. Plus there's a ton of other legendary creatures in the cube. So it's not like it has to be an Eldrazi like Othari or Velimachus. So, or, I mean like all of these are legendary, right? Like this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. And Velimachus I added because there was a cool, like, I think it was a modern deck or a pioneer deck that had time warp and you were Velomachusing and trying to look at the top seven and hit Time Warp, and then you just keep repeating that. You're like, okay, let me attack with Velomachus again, hit a Time Warp, attack with Velomachus. And considering there's both Time Warp and Time uh, Walk in the cube, plus things like Regrowth or Eternal Witness, like I thought this was a cool card to include to look at the top seven, and then you get to cast an instant or sorcery with mana value less than its power. So you get to just cast a free instant or sorcery that's five or less. I mean, this guy just seems cool. Flying Vigilance Haste, the 5-5 five, five for 7. Again, big splashy effects. Kind of things like you want to, like you want, like, this is the kind of thing you're like, it's exciting when you do it. I want cards that have an exciting effect when you do them. Which is why, like, I do kind of eschew cards like Mishra's Bobble. Because I'm like, there's nothing exciting about this card. It is, it is a necessary evil, right? It's like... Hydroid Crassus, I have, I, I have removed. Um, I, it's still good. I don't really have any issue with Hydroid Crassus. <clears throat> I just think it's kind of expensive and clunky. Kin and Bonder is fantastic. I was really impressed with this card in the most recent iteration of Vintage Cube, and I added it myself. And the reason being, like, having this kind of, like, natural order tooth and nail effect on the card for seven mana is really, really good. Um... Just being able to have this like repeatable effect similar to Golos uh, is kind of cool. Just putting a non-human creature into play is great. It gives you some some card advantage and some reach for the green decks. And it gives you like a mana sink for your for your green decks as well. Oko, awesome. Sound of the West, really good. Tamio, I don't like at all. Um, I'm surprised Matt out of this, but I again, like he's a bigger combo player than I am. I just think the plus one ability is meant for constructed. It's not meant for limited. Choose a car. It's meant for decks that have four copies of cards. Choose a non-land card name, then reveal the top four cards. Like your odds of hitting in vintage cube is so low. So this is just like basically a four mana regrowth a lot of the times. And then like you get to plus one a couple times. Maybe you'll hit, maybe you're just filling your graveyard to get one of the cards back. 
it's an it has interesting interactions but it just kind of like feels like you can't really fully utilize it in limited and i really like that that matt still has coma i also have coma i think it's a really cool card i think it's very strong but i think it's also very well balanced where it costs seven it's blue and green so yeah my simic looks like kinnon oko i'm surprised there's no euro in matt's queue i think euro is still just fine i have sale i have bring to light because again, like five color decks, Valky, things like that. Like Bring to Light for Niv Misery Reborn is a sweet interaction, I think. And then also of Coma. And also all the cards that I'm showing you on my cube are version specific. So these are the exact versions I have in my cube as well. And then he has one Simic, one non black, and one non red. Uh, so Leovold, Omnath, and Atraxa. No issues with any of these. These are all obviously fantastic. I have a qu quite a few more uh, gold cards in my cube. So we have Esper, Sphinx of the Steelwind. Still think this guy is great. It's a great tinker target. It's a great card to reanimate against red and green decks. Just think it's totally fine. Nickel Bolas the Ravager, which I think is a super sweet four drop. Uh, just makes them discard a card. So it's like a four, 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 four that can flip into a Planeswalker. Cruel Ultimatum, because I have Dream Halls and I think Dream Halls is super sweet. I'm always, I've been, I, I'm, I was consistently impressed with Dream Halls uh, in the Vintage Cube. Uh, Nicobolus Planeswalker also works really well with Dream Halls, but a lot, actually it's funny because Nicobolus Planeswalker is actually a holdover from when I had Arena Rector in my cube. But I took Arena Rector out, but I still think Nicobolus deserves a spot. Again, it's a cool Dream Halls, Dream Halls target. Croxa and Kunaros. This is another uh team up card that i thought was really cool it's a six six for six with vigilance menace and lifelink so lots of abilities when it enters the battlefield or attacks you can exile five cards from your graveyard so you, you basically escape and then you can return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield so i don't know man every single time you can attack that's pretty good so exile five cards get our kind of cruelty back just for attacking with this guy i don't know Seems pretty good. Like the only restriction here is the mana, the mana cost. Inspired Ultimatum. I added this specifically because of Dream Halls, obviously. Leovold, Omnath, Atraxa, the same mat cards. And then my five color cards are Garth One Eye. Because again, it's cool to tap this guy to get a Black Lotus. That just feels good. Invasion of Alara. Um, this is hard to read like this. When enters the battlefield, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile two. I can't, this is, this is too much. In Al. I should have been more specific. I was trying to be cute. I wonder if in Val will find it. Uh, in Vala. Okay, that's close enough. Okay, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile two non-land cards with mana value four or less. You may cast one of those two cards, put the, Put one of them into your hand, then put the other cards exiled this way on the bottom of your library. So you're drawing one and casting one kind of for free, but kind of not. And then you transform into Awaken the Maelstrom. Target player draws two cards. You may put an artifact from your hand onto the battlefield. Create a token that's a copy of a permanent you control. Distribute three plus one plus one counters among one, two, or three creatures you control. And destroy target permanent and opponent control. So kind of a sweet, um, just like five mana get net two cards and then f if you're able to like flip it it's kind of cool so uh jared cartholion another another cartholion two cartholions in the cube it's a family thing create a three three kavu with trample for plus one negative three choose up to two target creatures for each of them put a number of one one counters equal to the number of colors on it so if you have like a niv mizzet reborn you're putting like five counters on it it's pretty good and return target multicolor card from your graveyard to your hand if the card was all colors draw a card and create two treasures for negative six not hard to get to negative six when he costs five niv is reborn everybody knows what that guy does omnath locus of all oh look at that it's a it's a march of machines omnath if you would lose unspent mana that mana becomes black so basically you can tap all your mana at the end of the turn and get a bunch of black mana at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, look at the top card of your library. You may reveal that card if it has three or more colored mana symbols in the mana cost. If you do, 
add three mana in any combination of its colors and put it into your hand. If you don't reveal it, put it into your hand. So, I, like, this card seems really good, and I'm actually surprised I haven't seen it in a cube yet. So, you're basically drawing an extra card every turn, am I, am I right? At the beginning of your pre-combat pre -combat main phase, look at the top card of your library. You may reveal that card if it has three or more colored mana symbols in its cost. If you do, add three mana. You get three, if, if it has three more colored symbols, you get to reveal it and get th three mana for free and put it in your hand. If you don't reveal it, put it in your hand. So you're getting it put it in your hand either way. I don't know, man. It seems really good. So it's like, it's it, the, the goal is to reward you for drafting five colors. And two-headed Hellcat is obviously just a phenomenal magic card. This card was a was a banger in the Cartographia cube. Five, five flying menace haste. When it attacks, you draw two. It doesn't have to connect. It doesn't have to deal any damage. You just draw two as soon as you turn it sideways. So those, we I think we have significant differences in terms of multicolor. I have 84, he has 57. But I think there's a lot of fun and value uh, in the multicolor slots. And I also think, like I'm kind of rewarding players for choosing those, those multicolor roads. So hey, here's some green red cards, go green red. Here's some multicolor card, here's some five color cards, go five color. Hey, ended up Mardu, here's a Croxa and Kunaros, you know? Um, as far as lands, my cycle is at a, uh, pain lands now. Now it's pain lands because I've added um, Eldrazi to my cube. But it previously was check lands like Glacial Fortress, Dragon Skull Summit, things like that, Rootbound Crag. Um, so right now I have pain lands, creature lands, fetch lands, shock lands, and dual lands. Matt has the same. He kept his his fetch lands down here. They are not categorized by color pair. Um, but he also has fast lands. I really just don't like fast lands. I, I I find the times you draw them after turn three. So let's say you have two fast lands in your deck that come into play tapped. Your odds of drawing those two fast lands after turn three feel much higher than drawing them before turn three. Whereas like a check land, like a glacial fortress, your odds of drawing that, uh, it's going to be the same, right? But I, so I'd rather have lands that are going to come into play tapped after turn two or three, uh, when I'm more likely to draw them than lands that come into play tapped before that point, if that makes sense. Like if I have the same chance of drawing a glacial fortress or a sea chrome coast, and it's easier to make the, sea, the the Glacial Fortress come into play untapped. I'd rather have the Glacial Fortress. So that's why I'm just not a big fan of these. Like, I feel like they're always coming into play tapped. Or, like, I have a, a combination of Celestial Colonnade and Sea Chrome Coast. And, like, if I play this on three, this is never going to come into play untapped again. Whereas Glacial Fortress still could. So pretty, pretty, pretty st uh, standard here. All the triomes, all the headquarters. I don't even know what to call these. They're still triomes. Let's just call them triomes. I took Academy Ruins out of my cube because I don't have Mind Slaver anymore. Uh, Ancient Tomb I have. Obviously, Arid Mesa. I put Boseju in. I have Dark Depths. I have Gaia's Cradle. I have Caracas. I don't have Library. I don't own a Library. Um... It is on my list, and I'm pretty sure I'll find a spot for it once I get it, because I think it's both iconic enough and good enough to include. I've also, I picked up a Lotus Field. It's on my list of cards I want to put in. I just haven't find, found a spot for it yet. I think it goes really well with Thespian Stage and Candelabra, which I think Matt has. Maybe, I guess not. Yeah, there it is. I don't like those are the two. Those are the two big money cards I just don't have is Cam Candelabra and uh, Library. Um, Maze of Ith is kind of junk. I really don't like Maze of Ith. I think it it promotes really boring, repetitive gameplay where like your opponent has to have two creatures. One of them has to be better than like they both have to be better than your worst creature. Like, it's like, if I have a 5-5 five, five and a 2-2, two, two, and you have a 3-3, three, three, like, my 2-2 two, two can't do anything, neither can my 5. Like, it just invalidates things. It slows down games. It's just not fun. And I feel the same way about Rashadon Port. 
like all these repetitive effects that kind of like keep targeting the same thing every turn and they don't forward gameplay. They just kind of see, you just kind of sit there behind them. <laughs> They're just not fun. I, I don't know. I think Maze of Ith and Rashad and Port are both kind of garbage for that reason. Like, and also the number of games where someone would actually untap and then like tap my, my land with a Rashad and Port just, they weren't that high just because no one was really playing Rashad and Port. I have Factory, have Workshop, have Odawara, have Vista, have Sheldock, have Strip Mine. I added Strip Mine and Wasteland. Someone asked if I had these in my cube because I didn't for a long time. And I think recently the inclusion of both of Candelabra, of Elvish Reclaimer, of Dark Depths and Hex Mage, I think all those cards have made the land cards a lot more fun and a lot more varied. So it's not always like I'm playing crucible and fast bond and only strip mine or only wasteland. A lot of times there's a lot more strategy and a lot of more, a lot more play to those archetypes now. So I have included them because I don't really feel that getting strip mined out of the game, um, for like, you know, strip mine twice. Every single turn is really that common anymore. Um, but the land archetype still exists and it's still, it's still fun. I think it's still a good inclusion. I also have Thespian Stage. I still have Sheldock. I have Talarian Academy. I have Urza Saga. I have Wasteland and I have all of these fetch lands as well. So pretty similar land wise. I don't think Maze of Ith or Rashad and Port are worth it. I think they're just kind of, they're just kind of annoying lands. Like I also try to take out, I try to minimize the number of cards that just annoy and frustrate people in my cube which is why I don't have storm, but yeah, I think our cubes are fairly similar. I think his skews more towards hyper spiky magic online vintage cube. And my mind leans towards cool commander cards that do big splashy effects that kind of like force you to like kind of play into these kind of things. Like, like I don't think you're going to have very many experiences where like you're using it like Obnixilis's ability or like, um, you know, Kaya, Kaya, either one of these Kayas, like I bet there's a very few times players have cast these and, and had to like recur their abilities and use them over and over because they're just, so it's like they're new play patterns that you're not really used to, but they are still really impactful and powerful. So I think that's kind of what I lean towards when I, when I want to build a cube. And, uh, also, yeah, just, just to notice we're both using the, the most recent, uh, enemy, enemy colored, uh, enemy color pair creature lands. <laughs> so we all have restless bivouac, Ref restless cottage, restless spire, etc. Um, I think a lot of these are just straight up better than the previous versions. I think the Orzov one is the biggest kind of whiff. I think shambling vent might be better, but I think it's worth trying this one. And even if it's a little worse, it's totally fine. Shambling vent was very good. So it can be a little bit worse. But yeah, those are our two cubes. Let me know if you guys have any questions. I would love to see more of your comments. Let me know what you think. Hope you guys have enjoyed this. I, I have a really good time. I have a really good time talking about cube. I love cube and um, I love design decisions. I love, I love talking about what cards we should put in or why I have certain things in there. So if you have any questions, definitely let me know and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much for watching.